Today, I'm going to talk about this work that we have been doing at KU11 for a couple of years now, which is based mainly on drawing connections from the field of statistical relational AI and the field of neurosymbolic. So this presentation is based also on many slides that um, we have shared with colleagues in other tutorials. And so I thank also them for this. Now, um, if you want an update version of this uh, lecture, but also some um, two surveys on this one, which is short term and another one, which is longer, you can go to this link. I will post it later also in, in the chat. I forgot uh, so that you can copy it, but uh, you can access also to this uh, presentation. So let's just start with a bit of motivation and so. I am shown here two tasks, and I would like for you to think about how much effort do you need to solve them. So in the first task, you see this picture of this girl and ask you to answer if she's smiling or not. And on the other side, we have a task where we have a multiplication and asking you the result of this multiplication. So I have no doubt that you make no effort in answering this, the first one, while probably in the second one, you need a couple of seconds to actually apply the algorithm for the multiplication and answer it. And now this behavior of human decision making is very well known in the behavioral sciences and is also been the main topic of the um, like uh, Nobel uh, Prize um, Dan, uh, winner Daniel Kahneman that uh, described human behaviors and human decision-making has like governed by two processes. One that is fast and yes, the one like the one connected to the answer that you give to the girls that was smiling and the other one is low and it is more effortful and requires cautious uh, planning. And, and actually it is not even the case that tasks can require either one of the two, but in general, you can have tasks that requires both the process. Suppose that you have to solve this like driving license test and you have this picture and you're asked, okay, which of the cars can go first in, in this image? It's clear here that you need to do mainly two things. First of all, you have to understand the scene that you are looking at. Where are the cars? Where are the traffic signs? And after you have this idea, then you have to apply the rules that you have learned in case and who, who, who can go first. And, and usually the first part, the one, the one that you want to parse the scene is usually connected to this thinking fast paradigm, while the second one, the one that you have to pick the rules and reason about them is connected to the thinking slow. And the nicest thing about this division is that Actually, also artificial intelligence and computer science have often been divided in communities that focus either on one or on the other. So this thinking fast is usually connected to what is called sub-symbolic reasoning and thinking slow with symbolic reasoning, but similar terms for the sub-symbolic part are also associative tasks, data-oriented, learning-based or noisy, noisy inputs, while for symbolical, we have logical knowledge based on reasoning and planning and precise input. So this distinction seems to be pretty uh, like adherent also on the, the field of artificial intelligence. And if we are, want to go a bit further into the paradigms that govern these two, these two areas, there is no doubt that for the thinking fast paradigm, Neural networks and deep learning are probably the, 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 the main paradigms, the one that they have been super successful in learning these functions that map perceptual data to an answer uh, and having like a, a tremendous um, like uh, result. But at the other uh, at the other time, there are also the two most uh, like uh, common paradigms in the reasoning and think is low, which are logical inference and logical reasoning and probabilistic inference. So we have these three, these three paradigm. And actually, the the goal would be that we would like 
artificial intelligence model to integrate them as much as possible. And so the question is that, how can we do this? Actually, this is not even a novel question. This task has been around in the community of AI forever, since AI, AI exists itself, and have been like a proposal on how to integrate um, pairs of these paradigms. For example, we can say that deep learning has mostly focused on using the neural and, and probability paradigms to integrate them, and usually from a learning perspective, you know, where the probability modeling allows for sound learning uh, algorithms. But at the same time, also the integration of logic probability has been the main focus of study of the field of statistical relational uh, AI. And, um, and finally, also the, the link between logic and neural has been the focus, again, from a learning perspective of the field of neurosymbolic, of neurosymbolic. So the key message for this lecture, and the thing that I would like to show you is that actually Star AI which is a field that is a bit more mature than neurosymbolic, actually have uh, like faced and solved many problems and found many solutions. And it turns out that these same solutions, these same ideas very, uh, are very like similar to the ones that neurosymbolic solves. And thus these links can really help us to find and lay the foundations for uh, a potential integration of the, the three paradigms. So this will be the, the key message of this presentation and the, the, the main idea behind uh, this talk. So we have drawn uh, seven dimensions that can help drawing this connection. I will not be able to talk about all of them, but I will focus to the main ones today and the one that um, may only show this uh, uh, this uh, this link, but we will touch a little bit uh, everything during the, the the talk. So the presentation would be mainly based on these different dimensions. We will go over all of them and see how and which connection we can make from Star AI to neurosymbolic. And let's start from the the first one, which is uh, um, based mainly on a logical perspective and and usually in computational logic. There are two main ways of using logical formalism, one that is proof-based, one that is model-based. And let's see how this is uh, like uh, transferred to statistical relation AI first and then neurosymbolic. So let's start with the proof-based and in order to describe proof-based, let's start with logic programs. So logic programs like this uh, one that you see in the slide, are, and like uh, like those that you can write, for example, with the programming language product, are built by facts. So statements that are true. For example, in this very famous uh, example, there is the burglary that is true. Earl's alarm, Mary is true. These are facts, things that you know all true. And then it's made by a set of rules. And the interpretation of these rules is very important for this proof-oriented uh, vision of the logic, because these rules are computational rules, should really be seen as computations. Because, for example, the rule I like that in the slide here tells that calls Mary can be set to true if both alarm is true and else alarm Mary is true. So this is really, we are computing the value for calls Mary given the values of other two facts, like alarms and else uh, Hertz alarm Mary. So how this turned out into a proof base or proof oriented inference of the logic? Well, because these logic programs are usually used to answer queries. So suppose that we ask the program, okay, I have this program, I have this fax, will Mary call? Well, we can start from the, from the query and one way of uh, answering this query is going backward in an algorithm that is known as backward chaining. So you start from the, the, the query and you look for rules or facts that supports this query. And for example, here we see that we have a rule the, here that, um, uh, that tells that cause Mary is true if alarm and hearse alarm Mary is true. So we can turn this query into two new queries, alarm and else alarm Mary, and we can continue. For example, we can look at alarm and we say, oh, look, there are two different ways in which alarm can be true either if an earthquake is true or if a burglary 
is true. So this uh, this proof here now is like forked into two different uh, possible proofs, and we can continue here. For example, earthquake we know is true, so we can delete it from the set of, of query that we want to prove. And Earth's alarm, which is the only one that is remained, is also true, and we don't have anything else to prove. So this is a, a good proof from Cold Mary. So we can say yes, Cold Mary is true because, and we can follow all the path in 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 this proof, and we can do similarly for the other path. So in this case, this a uh, the so-called proof theoretic view of logic. Well, we build proof or proof trees to answer uh, to answer uh, queries. Now, the other way, instead of using logical and logical formalism, is to, uh, to look at logic as constraint. This is the usual case, for example, in SAT solvers. So here we are not interested, uh, so the rules are not computational rules. They are not helping us to compute anything, but they are just constraint on a set of variables. And what we are interested in, in this case, is in models of the of the theory, and which is a model. A model is like an assignment of a value to all the variables in the all the propositional variables in this theory. So, for example, if you look uh, in, to the right of the slide, and uh, if you consider these four facts, which means that only these four facts are true, while all the others are false, well, it's easy to see that this is a model of this theory. We can try to look up a couple of them. For example, since burglary is true here then the, uh, the head of this the implication is true. And also the tail of the implication is true because alarm is also in the model. So this rule is satisfied by this model. You can do the same for the others and see that this model here is a model of, of the theory. So when you have logic as constraints, what you usually look, you look for models of the theory, which is what usually SAT solvers does and the SAT problem is about. So finding model and assignments to variable given the constraints. This is the model theoretic view that we have on logic. Now, we have looked at this both program and constraints into propositional logic. So every uh, fact and every uh, atom in the rule has no structure. They are just statement, propositional statement that can be true or false. But if you see, for example, the program that we have analyzed here, the last two rules, they are pretty much uh, symmetric. They just, there is some, we can see a structure there, and this is what usually is done in first order logic programs when you say, okay, well, we introduce domains. For example, there is a domain of people here, which is made by two elements, Mary and John, and then we can define rules using variables to say, okay, everyone, so the, uh, any person call if there is an alarm and if that person call. And we see that we can have a more compact representation of the program, uh, of the program using this uh, this first order logic formula, which is very important and will be very important in the following. So in this case, logic is actually a template for many propositional uh, uh, propositional rules. So this first order rule is a template for many other uh, propositional rules. And this templating is kind of fundamental in, uh, in the rest of, uh, of this dimension. And what is the meaning of this, uh, of this uh, program? Well, I was telling you the meaning is just the same of the corresponding propositional uh, program that you obtain when you substitute all the possible uh, elements of the domains to the variable. And this is usually called uh, like a grounded theory. So you start from the first order logic where you have rules with variables and you ground all the variables with all the elements of the, of the domain. You obtain this second uh, program, which is propositional because here the, 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 there are no variables uh, anymore. So the meaning of this program is the meaning of this other program. So if you prove something here, you have to obtain the same proof that you would obtain uh, here. But interestingly, uh, um, interestingly enough, what is good about first order logic programs is that actually you don't need necessarily to ground entirely the, the, the program and reason on the entire program, but you can reason directly uh, at the, the first order logic level. And this is uh, an, uh, 
an example. So suppose that the program is the one on the top right here. So where we have that um, there is hand that is stressed and N influence Bob and Bob influence car. And then you have two rules that say, okay, someone smokes if he's stressed or someone smokes if he's influenced by another uh, person uh, who smokes. And so we could suppose that our query is smoke car. We have two ways of solving this problem. Either we pick this rule and we ground all the possible rules, but okay, grounding them is a combinatorial problem because we have to take, for example, for this uh, rule, which is two variables, all the possible pairs of person. So if the number of persons starts growing, this grounding theory becomes to be very, very large, or we can try to reason directly on, on the first order, uh, sorry, on the first order uh, level. And for example, here we say, okay, is car smoking? Well, we can look in uh, our uh, theory and we say, okay, we have two rules that can prove smokes, either if uh, car is stressed, but we don't know anything about car stress, so we can follow this, or if car is influenced by someone who smokes. So we have this rule here, and then we have to say, well, we can look if there is someone that influenced Carl. For example, we know that Bob influenced Carl, so we can remove this fact, but we have to prove that uh, Bob smokes. And you can continue this. So in this case, you can still use this proof-oriented, proof-theoretic view of the logic without uh, grounding uh, the theory. So the ground theory is never really instantiated. This is very, very, uh, uh, very, very powerful. Uh, uh, paradigm. So how this, oh now, before I forgot, also this first order um, view can be easily applied also on the constraint and model theoretic. I will not talk about it because similar conclusion applied there. What I want to talk about is, okay, how this proof-based and model-based uh, uh, model are transferred to the um, probabilistic domain. And this is uh, what like statistical or rational AI is fundamentally based on. And it brings us to the second dimension, which is the dimension of directed versus undirected models. And in particular, what I will show you in this uh, second dimension is that this proof versus model based uh, view on logic is actually carried over to the statistical relation AI, where you have probabilistic logic programs, which like covers the proof theoretic view of the logic versus Markov logic, which is said covers more the model based or constraint based view of logic. So the idea is for star AI, one way of looking at star AI is how star AI has announced this two view of logic with probabilistic arguments, with statistical arguments. And we will see that there is this very nice uh, link because any proof-based model can be uniquely and one-to-one -one mapped to a Bayesian net, while any model-based logic can be mapped one-to-one -to, -one to a Markov net or an undirected uh, models. And as I will try to show you, this creates really a complete integration between uh, the logic and the probabilistic uh, paradigms. So this is the logic program that we were looking at uh, before. So what to do in order to announce this problem, uh, this uh, program with probabilities? Well, the fundamental idea, which is um, due to Sato and Pru, is the so-called distribution semantics. The idea is that every random variable uh, every sorry propositional variable in the program, like the pro the the facts of the of the program, are turned into random variable, or not even turned. They are at the same time both a random variable and a propositional variable. And this creates thing, an interface between the logic and the probability. And syntactically, what is needed uh, to make this extension is to introduce probabilistic facts. So probabilistic facts are standard logical facts which are labeled with a probability. So the probability of being true. So these probabilistic facts have to be intended like uh, independent random variables, 
So usually uh, binomial random variables, and then the logic on top of that creates uh, like links and constraints among these random variables and can allow for very complex uh, inference. So, okay, and how do we use this, the proof-based uh, approach, uh, how to extend it to the probability? Well, the idea here is that while in logic you are interested in the, the value of a, of a query, if a query is true or false, here you are interested in the probability of a, of a, of a fact, of a, of a query. So suppose that here, for simplicity, the query is just alarm, and so we are interested, okay, what is the probability of alarm being true? And you have two different, uh, uh, two different uh, proof for this, either if burglar is true or if uh, earthquake is true. In general, the probability of, of a proof is the product of all the facts that you have used along the proof. Here it's very easy because there is only one fact for both the proof, so one could start thinking, well, it's easy, we first we compute all the probability of the proof and then the proof of the, the query is the sum of the probability. Well, this is actually not the case because these are random, uh, uh, are like a random event and in general the disjunction of an event is not really only the, the sum of the probability of the single events but you have also to subtract the, the, the in, um, intersection between the two events. And this is known as the disjoint sum problem, which brings a new level of complexity to inferencing probabilistic logic program with respect to just uh, logic programs. Uh, but it's also the thing that makes actually this program as expressive as any uh, probabilistic um, graphical model like Bayesian nets. So how can we actually perform this uh, disjoint uh, sum problem. Well, there is a very nice uh, um, uh, view that follows something related to a proof process, which is called probabilistic causal laws. And the idea here is that you start by uh, making choices about the probabilistic facts that you have in your in your program. So in this case, we start by making a choice about earthquake, but since earthquake is a deterministic fact, we have only the possibility of choosing earthquake as true with probability one. Then we have to make a second choice and we can start by this rule. Since earthquake is true, we can use this rule and we know that this rule fires in the 60% of the cases. So in 60% of the cases, alarm is true. In the remaining 40% of the cases, alarm is not true. Once we are in this intermediate program, then we have to make the choices for all the other uh, facts. So we can pick these other facts here, burglary, which is true with 005 and is false with 95% and go on and so forth. And at the end, if we want to know what is the probability of alarm, which was our initial um, query, we can just go over all the proofs and pick the ones where there is a, at least one alarm that is true. Like, for example, this one, we have two alarms. This one, we have one alarm. Even if this is no alarm, we have alarm from here. And, and since we always have made a, like this joint choice, either is true or not, all these like leaves in the tree are mutually exclusive. So in this case, we can actually just sum the, the probabilities of all the proofs. And so this is just the final answer. So you see, it's a bit diff more difficult than just following the proof but we can still compute uh, this. But the nice thing, and this is also the, what I uh, started mentioning before, is that you can always build from a probabilistic logic program a corresponding Bayesian network. And the idea is that you pick all your, your facts, becomes simply like the leaves in the tree in the, um, of the Bayesian net, while all the intermediate nodes are built like conditional probability tables given by the rules, given by the rules. And, uh, and this is very nice because it, it, this suggests us that we can always pick a probabilistic logic program, map it to a Bayesian network, and then use any algorithm that is used for making inference in Bayesian network to reason about both the, the logical part and the probabilistic, uh, the probabilistic part. And there are like 
many, many inference algorithms uh, for Bayesian network, approximate algorithms or exact algorithms, and everything is carried over to the other paradigm, which is extremely, an extremely nice and result because really statistical relation AI has created this uh, complete integration between the two, the two paradigms. And what does it mean? Well, this means also that also more complex uh, representation for Bayesian nets, like the, the, uh, the plate notations, are actually very easily expressible in probabilistic logic programs, because like plates are just variables in the logic programs, and the unrolling of the plates is just the grounding of a, uh, of a, a first order logic program, as we have seen before. So these first order logic programs are actually a very nice and very concise way of defining very complex uh, Bayesian networks with plate notations. But this is not the entire story because, uh, okay, this was what I was mentioning before, but you can actually put on top of this logical constraint. So you can pick a Bayesian net and um, correlate all the probabilistic and random variables uh, with logical statement, the, uh, which allows you really to have a very strong uh, and expressive model. And this is what is done in Problog, which is a system that has been developed in KU11, my university, in the last uh, 15 years. And this has been applied in very, in a lot of different domains, uh, for example, in dynamic networks for massively multiplayer real-time strategy games, or it's been used to um, analyze activities and tracking in videos, or for learning relational affordances in robotics, or also in the bioinformatics, or mutation networks, interaction networks, or uh, cause effect networks. So this is a really powerful language that can be used to model uh, a large uh, variety of tasks. And uh, if you, I don't know if this is uh, clear, but in the top you can see there is a link and we have a pretty deep tutorial on so you can try the, the system online. So if you want to try it, uh, you can go to that link and it's a uh, uh, very, very, very nice uh, uh, made system. So we have started with this proof based um, uh, proof theoretic view of logic and how this proof uh, uh, theoretic view of logic is carried to the statistical setting, how this maps to Bayesian nets. So one may wonder, okay, and what about constraints? Can we have a probabilistic interpretation of constraints and of the model uh, theoretic view of logic? Well, this is what is done in Markov logic. And the intuition is that while in general constraints over a set of variables can be seen as hard constraint, you can make the, the system probabilistic by introducing sub constraints. So cons these constraints are not really ruling out completely some model or some assignments to the variable you're interested in, but they provide, so um, uh, an assignment is more probable if it is satisfied more rules. So this is the idea behind Markov logic. So you can define prob probabilistic distributions over uh, assignments by introducing soft constraints over the uh, the um, over these variables and uh, uh, suppose let's make this uh, example so suppose that we have just two two variables we are interested in and these two variables are friends and above and happy bob and of course given these two variables we have four possible assignments which are the quadrants here in this uh, uh, in this slide, or sometimes they are called, these assignments are called possible words. So we can have that both friends and a Bob and Epi Bob are uh, false in this quadrant. In this quadrant, we have that friends and a Bob is false, but Epi Bob is true, and so on and so forth. So usually, if you pick a, a rule like this, and you consider it is in the standard SAT setting, Okay, you are interested in the, the words in which uh, either a friends and a Bob is false or a Bob is uh, true. And you can, you can find uh, uh, 
them. And so here there are two states, either a, a word is a model or is not a model. What Markov logic does instead is weighting them, telling them, okay, if you satisfy the rule, then those words are more probable than the others, but the others are not completely ruled out. They are just less, uh, less probable. And this could be nicely done in a log linear, uh, log linear model. So the weight of the rule can be really uh, thought as it's a normalized uh, probability. Um, and again, uh, the very nice thing about this is that this can be really mapped one to one into the construction of uh, a probabilistic graphical model. In these wild uh, programs are mapped to Bayesian nets, these ones are mapped to Markov nets, so the undirect version. So this is in a, an example taken from the slides of uh, Pedro Domingos. Suppose that you have these two rules where you say, okay, uh, uh, any person who smokes gets a cancer with a weight 1.5 and um, every uh, pair of friends um, are such that one smokes if and only if the other smokes. So either both smokes or both uh, don't smokes. So what you do here is, okay, you ground all the roots and you find all the possible uh, uh, variables. In this case, we have, okay, we have only two people, person and nine Bob. So if we ground this first rule, we have four possible uh, uh, variables, cancer and smokes and smokes Bob, cancer Bob. Same thing we can do for the second rule. Of course, we have to consider all the possible uh, pairs of uh, N and Bob, so we introduce. And then what we do in order to build the graphical model, then we just create clicks in the graphical model that connects all the variables in a room. So we can start, for example, with the smokes cancer. So we create a click between, between cancer uh, N smokes N and the click between cancer B smokes B. And for example, if we pick X equal to N and Y equals to Bob, we create a click between friends and Bob, smokes N and smokes Bob. And this way you can keep building. So here you really see that the logic, again, like it was at the beginning, uh, is a template for a graphical model. So you can use the logic and the grounding process actually to template uh, a graphical model. And that inference in this, uh, in this uh, um, probabilistic uh, logic is, can be carried out using standard techniques from probabilistic graphical models, which is an extremely nice uh, uh, result. And also Markov logic as an extensive uh, system implemented, it's called alchemy, and it has been uh, applied to all, uh, all kind of uh, of, uh, of that set. So if you're interested in, you can also look here. So what I showed here is that log uh, proof theoretic and model theoretic uh, view of logic can be transferred into the statistical relational uh, setting, into probabilistic uh, logic programs and Markov logic. And in both cases, the main idea is that the logic is used as a template for a probabilistic graphical model. And this is usually known as this knowledge-based model construction for K, B, and C. And now it's the time, okay, but what this has to do with neurosymbolic? Well, the idea is that people not really fully aware are actually using the same ideas also in neurosymbolic, completely the same idea. So in neurosymbolic, it's very, easy to spot two general uh, class of systems. Class of systems that we can call neural program and another class of system that we call logic as regularizer. And, as, and also in neurosymbolic, this knowledge-based model construction is the underlying idea. And in, as I will show you in a, in a moment, logic is used either to build the architecture of a neural net, which is the case for neural program, or to construct a regularization loss, which is the case for logic as a regularizer. But this directed, like the architecture, and undirected, like the loss, is pretty the same of statistical relation I and basic logic. So this, this distinction is pretty uh, basic and fundamental for all these integrated logic uh, frameworks. 
So probably the most famous and also foundational approach to the logic as a neural program is uh, KVAN, which is knowledge-based artificial neural networks. And the base idea is, okay, you pick a, a prolog program and you prove a query, and then you pick the, the proof tree and you consider the proof tree as the architecture of the neural net. Let's see uh, this example taken from the paper. So suppose that you have the, 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 um, the program, the propositional program in this case, on the left. It's a set of rule. Suppose that we are interested into the uh, query A. So we have A if B and Z, then we have two different rules for B. So the first thing that Kvan does is rewriting the program into a layered structure. So it's a completely uh, logical equivalent program, but this program has um, clearly defined layers of, of, of variables. So you have variables in the first layer, in the second layer, and so on and so forth. And then you build a proof tree, for example, for your query of interest. So if the query of interest is A, then we, you are building this proof on the right. So A is uh, true if both B and Z. So you have this first uh, conjunction node. And then B and Z, yeah, well, you have different ways of proving them. So you have this, this junction node for B, another conjunction node from Z, and you go home. And this is the base structure that is completely determined by the logic. This is really, uh, uh, really exactly like the um, using the logic as a template for the network. What Kvan does, then it adds a little bit of neural spice to it. So, for example, you start adding hidden units, like in, on the left. Okay, the slide is so wrong. Hidden unit is the other, but. For example, in the slide on the left, you add hidden neurons. What are these hidden neurons? Well, logically speaking, these hidden neurons are other variables, other predicates that probably you don't know, but you are considering a noisy environment where probably you don't have the complete knowledge. And also, you had spurious links. So as you pick these nodes and you start adding new, uh, new links. And these new links are actually adding variables to rules in a way that um, you consider that your knowledge of the rule is partial, you don't know all the rules. What you get in the end, it's a layered neural net. There are some like tricks about how to design the activation functions uh, in order for the initial program to be as close as possible as the derivation from the logic. But the basic idea is this one. You pick a program and you use this program and the proof structure as the base of building the architecture of the, of the net which, if you remember, was the similar idea to building uh, uh, Bayesian nets in, uh, for statistical relational AI. And even systems that are much more recent, like the lifted relational neural net, this is from 2015, so uh, 20 years later, but still use the same underlying uh, idea. You pick a set of rules and you unfold the rules to build an architect, uh, uh, a neural architecture what lifted version on your networks does differently for Kban is a more uh, like case choice of activation functions, and it is uh, they derive these activation functions from fuzzy logic, so they have a more uh, clear uh, adherence to a logical uh, way of performing the inference. But the underlying idea is again the same logic as a template for the architecture of the net. And another very nice work along this same line of using the logic for templating neural nets is neural theory improvers. Now, I, yeah, I was skipping a slide. So uh, in neural theory improvers, the idea is pretty the same. So this one that I'm drawing uh, on, on the right is just a proof from grandfather A Bart using the program on, on the left. Uh, I will not go to the, the program, it's exactly the same that we did before for uh, um, first order logic programs. Now, the, the, the main problem of logic you know, is that logic is exact. Either you have a rule that proves your, uh, your query, like for example, this first rule, if you are querying grandfather A Bart, we can only go further in the proof if we have a rule 
with this exact uh, uh, fact head in logic usually the concept of unification is used so this term here should unify with the head of one of, of, of the rules which is for example the case for this rule you can unify this uh, this query with this head so you can go further in the proving process however what will happen if we have something like this so what will happen if we have a query like grandpa head part now now as a human would say oh, look grandpa is just a synonym of grandfather you can use the true but of course this will never be uh, um, possible for a, a logical system and this is actually very common for example when you start bridging a lot of knowledge graphs that come from different uh, different domains with different ontologies it's, it's something that happens very 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 often so the idea about uh, neural tree improvers is say okay maybe we cannot unify them logically but we can use a kind of soft unification which means if we interpret this term these all these uh, like symbols like grandpa a part into uh, some hidden space, some numerical space, then we can start making some distances. And we say, okay, you can keep proving grandpa using the grandfather rule, but this proof will be weighted with a weight that you consider, for example, between zero and one to say, okay, I still prove it because I know that grandpa and grandfather are, are close, but the proof that I get is not as valuable as the one that I will have uh, got with a complete logical. And with this soft reasoning, what you get in the end, if you look at this, this is like a, a weighted connection. And what you get in the end is something that you can really relate to a, a neural net. So the proving pro process that you do, it's pretty much uh, the, an inference of a neural net. And the weights here have to be interpreted as these distances uh, of elements in embedded spaces. If we move now to the other instead uh, setting, so in model-based uh, uh, approaches, we have also a um, large number of uh, neurosymbolic systems that picks these constraints and turns these constraints into regularization losses, so into losses. So the idea here is different from before, well, before the logic was actually templating the architecture of the net, here the logic is templating a loss function. And one of the most uh, 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 known system is uh, semantic loss. And I will just make an example here. So suppose that you have a multi-class classification problem. And uh, like this um, neural nets here, you have three classes and they are like one with probability 0, 8, 0, 3, and 0, 9. And suppose that then you have some knowledge that tells, look, these uh, three classes actually are mutually exclusive. So you cannot really have all of them being true at the same time, but only one can be, can be true. Now, usually this is the case, for example, in neural nets you use uh, in supervised learning, you can use like a softmax, but if you have no, uh, no supervisions on these classes. How can you still enforce this rule? A softmax will not do the work without uh, an actual supervision. Well, the idea is that, okay, I have this rule and I can use this rule to template a loss function that force the network to satisfy the rule or in other terms that penalize the neural network to providing solutions that deviate from, from the logic. And in order to do this, you can pick the, the rule and you can turn the rule into a continuous function using probabilistic arguments. And the way you build this rule is similar, for example, for how we computed the probability of alarm. Here you can think that you are computing the probability that the atoms are mutually exclusive. So you can follow a similar uh, probabilistic reasoning process to build this, uh, this loss. And what you do at the end, you build uh, uh, a loss term, maybe I have, no, I don't have the slide here, but you build a loss term. This is the particular semantics of semantic loss. I will not go into the details now. We'll see something similar later. But the idea is this is a loss and you can pick this loss and you can plug this loss into any uh, loss uh, function uh, that you already have for, for a task that you are interested in. 
and uh, learn in your network with this loss. Uh, and this idea is not, oh, it's really, really spread in your uh, neurosymbolic and other uh, system is semantic space regularization. Here, the, the idea is uh, similar, but the paradigm that you use is different. In fact, here, the idea is that, okay, I still want to template a loss function, but I don't want to use probabilistic uh, arguments. But again, like it's been done in, in lift generation and network, fuzzy logic is used. So we can work out this particular example. So suppose that you have two rules, like the, um, the one that you see on the top of the image, this F and FR. F you can, is like an implication, which in semantic based regularization is really see as a supervision. The idea is that, okay, if there is some uh, uh, supervision predicate PA over the element D, so if you know from supervisions that A is true on D, that also your function A should be uh, true on D as well. So this is really us providing supervision. If you know that someone is true, then you really want to enforce that to be true. While the other rule, the second rule, is very similar to the smock rule that we have seen before. If there is a relation between D and D1, then either both D and D1 are um, true on A, or they are both false, or they are both false. So that is a uh, double implication. So suppose that you have this rule. What you do in semantic based regularization is that, first of all, you pick D1 and D2, which are two constants, but in a neurosymbolic setting, these constants are usually have a perceptual interpretation, like they can be images or audio files. And then you pick uh, the, the predicate A and you use a function, a neural net. So you have a function that represents A over the representation of D1. So this is computing the value. How true is that, uh, um, uh, how true is A on D1? These are a function. You do the same on D2. This is just an input layer. You're just computing some degree. And then you build the loss function. And to do the loss function, for example, you use a fuzzy translation of the first rule over these two predicates and a fuzzy translation of the second rule uh, using the, uh, the, these three predicates and fuzzy logic is continuous. So you can have also a um, continuous interpretation of the, of these logical rules, also of the quantifier. So at the second layer, you start aggregating things over all the possible Ds. And finally you sum up all the rules and you get a term in the output that is again, a loss functions over the function FA. So you are constraining the function FA in such a way that this uh, that has to adhere to the supervision, which is the first rule, and to the regularization FR, the second rule. And for example, you can show that with this formalism, you can easily uh, express manifold regularization. For example, here, this R relation is just creating some manifold between different points D and and the prime, but it's a very, very expressive uh, framework, which is also very similar to another framework, which is logic tensor networks, where the only difference here is that the neural nets are um, have a, a specific structure, but the underlying idea is, is the same. So to conclude this uh, first part, what we have uh, seen uh, today is that, um, a very foundational idea in computational logic where we have two views, proof theoretic and model theoretic approaches to logic has been used as base in statistical relation AI to differentiate between probabilistic logic programs and Markov logic, but actually the same divisions is carried also to the neurosymbolic setting and we have neural programs and regularized. So this is a very strong uh, distinction because you can easily find a lot of properties of this uh, of this uh, models of new these neurosymbolic models just by uh, uh, just by categorizing them into one of the two. For example, um, a property of the neural program of neural program is that since the logic is inside the architecture of of a network, it's easier to um, to perform logical inference in the network because you have 
the logical inference as one particular case of the network. So you can constrain the network to behave exactly logical in, uh, in a specific case. This is not the case of the regularizer, because since the logic is in a loss function, you're actually pushing the logic inside the, the, the weights of, of, of the network. And this gives you any guarantee about the fact if you can still reason completely logical or not. However, this comes with pros and cons, because neural programs are usually much more expensive computationally than the other approach. So it's as always is a trade-off, but similar trade-offs has been done in statistical relational AI uh, as well. So categorizing new symbolic system along these two uh, dimensions is extremely, extremely useful and provides a lot of uh, information. So we move now. Yes, I think I can uh, cover another dimension before the, the, the a break. Uh, it's the types of logic. So now, until now, we have talked about logic very generally, but there in computational logic, there are logic comes in very different flavors. So let's see how this maps to uh, to the neurosymbolic domain. Now we have already seen um, a difference. I slightly sketch the difference between propositional logical and first order logic. And I will show you that first order logic is very powerful because it allows you to build these very expressive short programs that templates also very complex uh, scenarios. Now, actually, first order logic uh, can be seen both in the logic programming setting. So where you have logic um, propositional or first order logic programs, but also in constraints, you can have propositional constraints or first order logic constraints. Their expressivity is pretty the same. There are some small differences, but you can, uh, I will not go, they are very tiny details, uh, but in general, they are the very and most expressive uh, frameworks. And for example, um, logic programs can express very nicely lists uh, or recursion, and that allows you to be as uh, expressive as a, a, a Turing machine. And uh, however, usually this the problem with logic programs is that they give you no assurance about termination because they are uh, Turing machine equivalent. So sometimes when you are um, sometimes when you still want to use logical arguments, but want something that is a good, uh, has a good expressivity, but guarantees use to terminate, you can restrict the, 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 the syntax. And for this is what is done, for example, in data log. Data log can be seen as a, a restriction over pro programs. The main restriction is that you have no structure term anymore. So you cannot use list and this kind of structure, but you have very nice, uh, uh, you can expect still very nice properties and logical properties. And, and this data log is, has been usually used as a query language for the deductive database in it. Uh, another, slightly different flavor of logic, of computational logic, is answered set programs. So in answered set programs, uh, they are logic programs that are still uh, like uh, guaranteed to terminate. So they, are, uh, they don't cover completely the expressivity of logic program, but they had it on top of this, some other uh, powerful expressive tools like preferences and soft art constraints, so that they make not completely uh, inside the first of the logic because you have this additional uh, power. For example, here are two uh, par uh, particular tools that you have in answer set programming, like choice rules. So there are these rules that has some kind of uh, disjunction, mutually disjunction on the head, which is something that is not allowed, for example, in uh, probabilistic programs or like constraints. So things that has a, a, a false head, something that cannot hold so that you can constrain your proofs uh, not to find any model with, uh, uh, with particular uh, properties. And finally, if I can... Uh, we have, okay, I don't know why, but I skipped. And finally, okay, we have propositional logic as the 
most simple uh, but less expressive tool. So if we will go uh, uh, the way back, we start from propositional logic, which is a simple propositional reasoning. Then you have data log that allows you to uh, model uh, database uh, queries, and then you go to answer set problem where you have database querying, but you have also this uh, uh, common sense reasoning and preferences. And finally, you have logic program and first order logic as the most expressive uh, tool. So why I made this introduction? Because again, also neurosymbolic is covering all these different cases. So you have neurosymbolic models that use one of these different uh, of these different uh, uh, formalisms. For example, semantic loss that we have seen before use a propositional uh, logic. So all the constraints that you can express in semantic logic should be defined using propositional uh, logic. Um, then we have data log. And actually this is a very important fragment because the vast majority of uh, neural programs actually use data log as a front-end logical uh, language. And the reason for this, it's actually uh, Simple if you think about it, because remember that uh, these neural programs use the logic to template the architecture of a neural net. So you want for sure something that terminates because you don't want an architecture that is infinite inside. And in general, you want not to be extremely expressive, not to have architecture that you cannot handle, you cannot learn over. So you still want something that is uh, um, that has a dimension that is feasible. And we have also answer set programs in um, uh, in the neurosymbolic setting. One is uh, Neurasp, and uh, Neurasp is uh, an answer set programs where choice rules, the ones that I've shown you before, are actually computed by neural nets. So this the, the choices are made by neural nets. There is a probabilistic interpretation of it, but the base. Uh, language is uh, ASP again. And finally, we have also neurosymbolic systems in the logic programming like deep prolog and um, and the prolog. And there is also, I put them differently, the fall constraints. So the system that does not use logic programs, but constraints, uh, first order logic constraints like logic tensor network, uh, neural marker logic networks, semantic based regularization and relational neural machines. So you see that this distinction that is like standard in, in, in logic is actually uh, another way of categorizing different neurosymbolic uh, systems. And so different types of logics exist. And by mapping one of these uh, systems to one specific logic formalism, you can easily understand their properties. For example, you know that system based on data log are usually more scalable than system based on on, pure, on uh, full prolog. Uh, so uh, also these other dimensions allows you to understand a lot of the properties of a of a system just to putting the system in the in the right dimension. So in the next dimension, we will talk about the learning point of view of these systems, we'll talk about structure versus parameter learning in system, but I think it could be a good time to make a, a pause. It's, we are almost half of the way. That's a good idea, Giuseppe. So let's move now to another dimension that can be used to make this comparison between statistical relation AI and neurosymbolic, which is a learning dimension. And in particular, we will pose, um, pose structure versus parameter learning one versus the other. So in general, in uh, star AI learning uh, concerns finding logical formulas or estimating the probabilities of the model. Now, in structured learning, you're interested in both. So you want to both learn the formulas or the probability, while in parameters learning, uh, you are only interested in the probabilities while you consider the structures given. And we'll see that this distinction is still very relevant in neurosymbolic. However, the distinction is not so crisp, not so sharp. 
but there is really a very like um, uh, learning comes in very different flavors in Nancy as learning is a much more fundamental task in neurosymbolic than it is in, usually in statistical relational AI. So let's start from the statistical relational AI viewpoint. And okay, what is learning in star AI? We have some data. In this case, this like showed us a knowledge graph where we have people and we have uh, uh, cities and we have relations between them. And what we are interested in is learning a model from the data and the statistical relation model could be, for example, a probabilistic logic program, as we have seen before, where we have rules and the rules have their uh, uh, probabilities attached. So there are these two paradigms in statistical relation AI, which is structure versus parameter. So in structured learning, what is provided is data. And what we are interested in learning is the structure of this data in terms of logical rules and the parameters of these rules. So the probabilities they are labeled with. In parameter learning, instead, we consider that as input, we have both the data and already the structure. So we know already the structure of the data. What we are unsure about and we want to learn from the data are the parameters, the probabilities. So let's start with parameter learning because it's usually the simplest uh, setting and it's also like a, a step in uh, structure learning. So it's propedeutical to structure learning as well. And okay, we see that the goal here is that we have given data and the rules, and what we want to learn is the labels of these rules. Now, one prototypical, um, so in general, um, uh, um, parameter learning, you know, um, so uh, parameter learning in statistical relational AI is very much as any other learning in parametric models. And if you remember this uh, link, this equivalence that we have made between probabilistic logic programs and Bayesian net and constraint models and um, like um, undirected graphical models, you understand that in the end, any uh, learning algorithm for uh, probabilistic graphical model can be used for statistical relation AI models. And so we have gradient descent algorithms, uh, least square algorithms, expectation maximization algorithms, specifically designed for uh, statistical relation AI, but the general paradigms of learning are those of any other parameter, uh, parametric model. Much more interesting and much more linked to the logical dimension of these systems is instead the structure learning, uh, structure learning uh, uh, task, where we are given, again, only the data, and we want to learn both the structure and the parameters. In structured learning, we um, like distinguish two kinds of, uh, of um, learning. One is discriminative and one is generative. So in the discriminative one, you have a, you distinguish your relation into background knowledge and target. So and the idea is that you consider the background knowledge as given and what you want to learn is a structure that uh, explain the process in which the target uh, relation is generated. So you can really think this as a predictive model. You want to learn the structure that allows you to predict or to discriminate a given target relation, which is counterposed with uh, instead with the generative model where you are interested in all the data generation process. So you don't have a specific target relation, but you want to learn how all the relations are uh, like um, are related to e each other. So you want to uh, be able to predict any relation in, uh, in your data set. Um, there is, in general, a very high level workflow for structure learning algorithms, where the idea is that, OK, you, since you have only data as input, what you can do at the beginning is just provide some candidates and so you provide a structure, then you learn the parameter of this structure, and then you use the model that you have uh, thus learned to evaluate on a given task. And if the evaluation is not good enough, then you uh, start again with a re refinement step where you 
refine your candidates and you learn the parameters again and you reevaluate and you keep doing this until your evaluation really satisfies you. And of course, this is a, um, a learning by searching. So the idea is that you have to make a step forward completely in the blind and then evaluate what you have uh, obtained and by this signal you can traverse your uh, your search space. And of course, usually the main problem of this uh, approach is that the, 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 the search space of this program is extremely huge and you have a combinatorial explosion by enumerating all the possible, uh, the possible ideas. So in general, the task in these uh, approaches is, okay, how can I traverse the, the space uh, in a smart way? So one, um, uh, one uh, method that does uh, structured learning in statistical relational AI is uh, PropFoil. So in PropFoil, you have given uh, some um, data, in this case, for example, this knowledge graph to represent uh, uh, parental relationships. And then you have a target. Uh, a target relation and some examples. So you know, for example, you have target relation which is grandparent. You want to know how grandparent is predicted, it can be predicted from your from your data, and you have some examples. So you know, in some cases where when a grandparent is true. So what you do here is that okay, you have no idea about the model at the beginning. So your the starting model is completely empty. And what you do, you start adding rules. And the idea here is that you start from the most general rule. So, and of course, what is the most general rule that you can say? Okay, everyone is a grandfather of everyone else. And so this is your initial model. And what you can do here is, okay, you evaluate it. And of course, you get very true results in this. So you start refining it. Say, well, maybe a grandparent is when there is a mother or when there is uh, an inverse mother, so that X and we just keep X, uh, Y and X, and so on and, uh, and so forth. And you reevaluate, not good enough, and you go a step farther. And, and you see here already here that the larger the number of, uh, of uh, relations you are available, the, the larger is the artist of these relations, so the, the larger the way you can combine the variables, the, the larger is the space. So the idea here is that at every step, you just pick one rule. You see here is that at a certain point, you have a, a rule with, with a very good probability, it's a deterministic rule. So you have this rule to your model, and then you start again. Because now the rules that you have like discarded before now can have an interaction with the rule that you have just learned that can provide better uh, better results and then you start again and this is for for example for probabilistic models but there are also algorithms in the uh, markov logic setting and one idea which is um, uh, due to Koch and domingos is that um, given a knowledge graph, like the one that you uh, see here on the, on, on the slide, you start to stratify some of the, of the, um, of the elements, of the constants of this uh, graph, of the entities of this graph, in a way that you group together things that have similar relationships. For example, here you can see that this is something like there is a book that is bought by a student that uh, is uh, like is teached by a professor and you see that all these elements in this level has similar relationships both with the book and with the professors also here is another department similar relationships again okay? so what you can do here is to use this relationship to define no nodes with same roles and what you build here is a kind of schema of your data, very approximate schema, of course. Uh, and what you can do after you have the schema is to traverse this, uh, this uh, called lifted knowledge graph and use the path as rules. So you can say, okay, there is a, a student that bought a book and this is teached by a professor, first rule. Then you can have another path. Of course, this can be much, uh, 
more complex than, than this. But this is a way that you can find relationships and constraints in, uh, in the data. But the process is the same when you search them, then you evaluate, then you train the parameters, the weights of these constraints, and if the final result is good enough, you are done, otherwise you keep uh, following a new path in these uh, lifted knowledge graphs. So if we want to make like a, an evaluation, the idea is that parameter learning is way easier, of course. You, you can use standard uh, learning algorithm that use gradient information because it's in the, uh, usually in a differentiable setting. So in general, you scale better, but you need an expert that provides the structure in, uh, in advance. And the structure should be specific of the particular domain and the quality of your model is extremely sensitive to the choice of the rules you make. So if you provide rules that are not good enough, you cannot hope to learn anything uh, meaningful. On the other side, we have structured learning, which has no need for, for expert rules, can just use data, uh, but learning here becomes a, um, a combinatorial problem because you have to search over the, the structure. And even though you start directly from data, as we have seen you still need to give some information about the language that you want to learn the because this language is what uh, defines the, uh, the, the 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 search that you want to do of course this language is much more general it's not specific to a domain but can be reused in other domains but still there is some effort from the engineer but if you want to make a parallel for example with a neural network learning, this kind of uh, language that you have defined is similar, for example, to the architecture of the neural net. So these are very general choices that can be good enough in very different domains. Uh, it's just defining a, uh, a way for, uh, for searching, uh, just to define the search space. So let's now move to the neural symbolic. So we've seen, sorry, I, these are the two paradigms. Either you learn just the structure or you learn the the, the, or you learn the, the parameters. Uh, in in, uh, in symbolic, however, we can see this as a spectrum. There are systems that do more of one, more of the others, so or something in the, in the middle. And we have, for example, different paradigms of learning that just use uh, data, someone that use a lot, uh, mostly data, but also a bit of indication of the of, of the structure. And then we have instead method that do structure learning just using parameter learning. So we just use parameter learning as learning paradigm. The first uh, approach is deep coder. So we have seen, for example, previously in um, in ProbeFoil that you start search and you use a very like very general systematic way of searching uh, the space of programs. So for example, by adding all the possible relations, all the possible combinations of variables. And this, of course, is deemed to fail except in very uh, simple cases. However, probably not all the search space is as good. Probably there are areas of this search space that are more promising than other, and this is the main intuition behind deep coder that says, okay, I want to just explore part of the space, which is more likely to solve the problem. And what is more likely? Well, more likely is something that you can learn from data. So uh, the idea is that you have a neural net that is used as heuristic for your search. So the search over the programs is guided by a neural net. So if you think that the single uh, so, so the setting is something like this. You, instead of starting from a single knowledge graph, uh, you start from pairs, knowledge graphs, and final program. And while, um, and you start searching. You start, start searching completely blindly, but then the search path that you do at that are more successful, so that better predicts the, uh, the, the, pro the target program are used for supervising a neural net. So that the second time that you search for a similar uh, task, the neural network can already give you some indication about which are the most useful function or 
uh, search uh, choices that you can make. So, for example, suppose that all the like decision in the search space that you can do is, for example, adding a function and you have a certain number of function. Well, you start completely blinding, but then you can a neural net can start to wait, giving an example, which are probably the, the functions that are more promising. So you see here that neural networks has a different role than uh, other systems because this, the, the, the final program that you get is still completely symbolic, but the neural network are just used to help you traversing the, the search space in an, a more efficient way. Now, deep coder does this at the level of the single function. So it doesn't, uh, the, the choice that it, it makes for a, um, um, a search step in the search space are independent on all the others that uh, it made before. However, what you can do and what Dream Coder does is instead using all the decisions that you take to define a, the probability distribution over all programs given the example, not just over the next function that you have to add in the, in the search space, but the idea is, is pretty similar. Now, this, in this way, you can actually define a generative model over programs in, um, using the guidance of neural nets. Another approach that still starts only from data is that uh, if you uh, still, use, so in Markov logic, you know, the, the, the potentials, we have seen that the potentials are defined like clicks in the space of the, um, of the atoms. So you have the atoms and you define, using your rules, you can define potentials. Now, the idea in the neural Markov logic is to make the, the, the potential soft as general neural nets, so that the, the structure that you learn in the same graphical model is now less interpretable, but much easier and much faster to learn. So you can avoid the combinatorial explosion, but at the cost of losing interpretability of the of the um, of the um, potentials of the rules that you learn. And another uh, method is neural generation. In neural generation, the neural nets are used like modern, uh, like NLP models. So the idea is that you give examples uh, of uh, input outputs, so the signature and the expected result, and you use a neural model to generate possible programs that uh, adhere to this uh, input output uh, signature. And then, but the nice thing here with respect to standard uh, um, neural generation model is that the evaluation is done symbolically. So the program that you get, you run it, and you can evaluate if the answer is good or not, and keep searching. So the search is a bit, still a bit uh, symbolic, but the, 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 the evaluation is symbolic. So you know that the program that you get in the end is a program that you can run exactly like uh, any other program. So the neural network, again, is not used as uh, the, as a, um, a final model, but just to help you searching the space of uh, possible programs. One instead approach that is a bit between structure learning and parameter learning is what is called program sketching. So in program sketching, you have still your examples, your input output uh, uh, pairs, uh, but you are not uh, you don't leave the search space to be all possible programs, but you fix a kind of sketch of the program. So you have a general idea how the program should be. But for example, you don't know some, some functions that has to be called in specific places of the, of the, um, of the, of the program, and you leave some blanks, blank spot there, and you use the the, the learning just to learn that function. And this is, of course, you can consider this as a bias over the search space because you are, you are just giving already a structure and you search only in the space of programs that has this particular uh, structure, which can uh, be much more efficient. But, uh, but in general, these sketches can be very general. For example, you can define a recursive uh, program so that just uh, like uh, loop over a list and call the same function, or you can use a uh, divide and conquer approach. So you can give these very general structures of uh, uh, of programs and just learning single small steps, which is much more efficient than um, 
uh, then uh, full search. And finally, the last uh, model is to say, okay, I know that parameter search is very efficient. So what you can do here is that you list as much rules as possible and just learn the parameters, and then you use the parameters as uh, as um, uh, as an indication if a rule should be kept or should be uh, should be uh, dropped. And the way you learn these rules is that you build these very huge uh, neural nets, and the way that you learn is um, uh, just learning standard backpropagation, so very efficient, but with a very large network. And this approach done in Su et al. in a system that is called Diflog. Uh, yes, the idea is that, okay, I have another slide where the rules that you built are actually built by uh, instantiating in all the possible way uh, a couple of templates. For, so for example, a template says that a certain relation between X and Y should predict another relation T on X and Y. And if your target relation is grandparent, then you are going to instantiate all the possible uh, P to T relations. And you do all of them, which is different, for example, from what PropFall was doing, which is was doing it one per time. And this is much more efficient because you have to learn the parameters just one time and you uh, have done it. But this has another problem that's that often many rules can have spurious interactions. For example, here you can have the two rules both predicts a target relation and then you share the weights between them. So maybe one could have been enough, but you will never be able to know so because you learn them together. So they can share the, the weights. And so you have this kind of spurious interaction such that the final problem program that you get it's um, it's usually bigger than the original one and a bit more noisy. So if you want to put all the all the systems together and make a kind of balance, what we uh, the pros and cons of all the models, we have that in general the neural guidance is the more general uh, approach uh, and. Mm, the idea is to use a neural net to guide the search, but you have to learn the neural nets. So this neural net is not, does not come for uh, for free, so you, so you need a lot of training data. So it's, again, the one that is less reliable of uh, human intervention, so providing a structure of biases for the search, but it's the one that requires more data. So the idea of soft patterns, which is the one in neural morphology network, makes the learning extremely efficient, no combinatorial search, but the structure is not explicit anymore. So you don't have very uh, uh, defined logical rules, but you have these neural nets that can do whatever they want. So you just keep the structure of the data, but not of programs. In neural generation, it's very similar to neural guidance, uh, where you need to learn this uh, generation uh, network that guides your search and in order to do this you need a lot of training data when you go to uh, to sketching sketching has uh, a much smaller uh, search space so to reduce the combinatorial search but it requires you uh, some significant user effort in defining the sketch of the of the, the program. And finally, we have the structure uh, um, learning via parameter learning. In this case, you don't have combinatorial search because you list all the rules in, in one time. But as I told you, many of these rules can interact with each other and the result that you get is a much noisier program with a lot of uh, spurious uh, interactions. Um, so yes, this was just a recap of what we said. And we move to the last dimension, which is semantics. So until here, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, uh, different dimensions that describe uh, starry eye and helps to classify starry eye models versus neurosymbolic models. But actually, we have not uh, digged into the main idea that allows for the integration. So both in uh, probabilistic logic and uh, neurosymbolic, 
the main important one of the many decisions that the designer should make is how to make these two components interact. Of course, we have given a lot of hints of how this is uh, actually done, but now we are trying to, to show how the standard Boolean uh, semantics of logic can be relaxed or can be made continuous in such a way that uh, it allows for learning or for the integration with learning paradigms like probabilistic graphical models or uh, neural nets. So, uh, in general, no, what is semantics in logic? In semantics, logic in, is connected to interpretation of, of the sentence. And interpretation is a value that you assign to a symbol of the language. For example, if you are told, uh, for example, human Socrates, this is some, so it's only a, like a syntactic construct. It could be at the same time equal to 47, 42. You have no idea what this means. What you, the, 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 the important thing that allows you to understand and to reason about is when you start giving values to these things. So selling human Socrates is true. So is this true and other things is true, then you can start reasoning and making inference over, over that. So here we are entering this dimension, we are exactly interested in this. Given a sentence, let's say propositional to make this uh, easier, uh, given a sentence of a logic language, what is the value that you assign to it? What are the possible values? And if you have composite sentences, how can you compute the value of a composite sentence given the value of uh, the, the single atomic uh, part? And the nature of this value will differ between the different semantics. Now, in order to make this discussion a bit more uh, easier. So if we are interested in knowing what these values of, of uh, sentences are, we can think that there is a function, L, that takes any sentence of the language Q and provides a value, V. So we are interested in knowing the properties, usually algebraic properties, because we are interested in differentiability of these uh, labeling functions. And let's start by uh, uh, Sorry, Boolean logic, and in Boolean logic, usually values there should be a yeah, another values are either true or false. So we know this; it's very uh, standard. So in order to give a value to a sentence, a complex sentence of the language, you need to follow three steps. First of all, you have to pick all the possible propositions, and you have to give a value to them. And remember that an assignment of true or false to all the possible uh, proposition is called a model or a possible one. So the first thing that you have to do here is giving a model. Then you have to define semantics for the operators. So for example, if you have the conjunction, so the labeling function for a conjunction is simply a truth table that takes the value, the truth value of the operands and gives you the, the value of the connective. And you can do this for all the other connectives. And finally, the, the, the label for any sentence, no matter how complex, can always be defined recursively on the semantics of this component. And this particular uh, like recursive evaluation is usually said to be an extensional approach of uh, the evaluation, which is very interesting from a both statistical relation and neurosymbolic viewpoint, because you can draw a graph that describes this process of assigning uh, a value. So if we have this function here, burglary or earthquake implies alarm, no, you can build an expression tree, which is the one on the left here, very, very, very easy. And then you can interpret each of the elements of this tree. For example, first you can interpret all the proposition, which means you give a particular model, and then you can evaluate this, uh, this circuit bottom up. So you start from the bottom and you start computing it and what you get as output of this circuit is the evaluation of the entire sentence. So Boolean logic was just to uh, set the stage. The problem is that if we really want to use this in a learning paradigm, and usually when I mean learning paradigm in neurosymbolic, it means 
gradient descent and back propagation, these circuits need to be differentiable, which is not the case for Boolean logic. So we have, in general, two ways of making uh, the, the, the logic uh, differentiable. Either you change semantic, so you provide an alternative semantic, which is what is done using fuzzy logic, and so you use a semantics that is continuous, or you can add an additional layer of semantics on top of the Boolean one, which is probabilistic logic, and we are going to uh, uh, talk about both of them. So fuzzy logic is still a pure logical semantics. It's just you are sharing. You say, okay, for me, things are not true or false anymore, but they can take any value between zero and one. With zero being totally false, one being totally true, and but all the other values between them are allowed. But then the process of evaluating sentences of the language is completely parallel to the one of Boolean logic. First of all, you assign values to the proposition. So a model in fuzzy logic is an assignment of values between zero and one of all the, la the, the proposition of the language. So if the, the, the proposition of a simple language are burglary, earthquake, hearse alarm, John, you give values. So burglary is a lot true, earthquake is almost false, and your alarm is very true. And I want you to point to the this value here. Uh, if we say that, for example, an earthquake is true zero one, we really mean that there is an earthquake, but the earthquake is very mild. So it's more connected to intensity, or usually it's called vagueness. Vagueness. But it, is not, it does not mean that there is a probability of an earthquake between two one. You see the, the difference. One is in, in intensity and vagueness, while the other one, the probabilistic one, is more about the uh, uncertainty that you have. This is very different and it's also a problem, in, as we will see, in neurosymbolic, because people don't usually make much of a difference between the, the two. Then, as in, in, uh, in Boolean logic, you have to give labels to the operators. Now, of course, since the values for fuzzy logic are continuous, we move from truth tables to continuous functions. And in this case, um, T norm are defined. T norm is a binary function that extends a conjunction to the continuous case. There are a lot of T norms that one can define. Three th fundamental T norms are the Lukasiewicz, the Gödel, and the product. And you know, yes, we can make an example. Suppose we have the product T norm. And the product T norm is just the product of the true value. And you see that it's very similar to the Boolean case. In the Boolean case, you know, if at least one is zero, then the conjunction is zero, which is how the product also behaves. If, because if you make the product for some Thing that is zero, then it gets zero. The only way to make one if is both are one. But of course, the product T norm can be defined also on all the intermediate values, like all the other uh, T norms. And these are just continuous versions of the, of the conjunction. And given a T norm, then you can define all the other operators. Um, these are just continuous versions of true tables. Instead of having tables, you have functions, but these are continuous functions, these are differentiable. And then, again, if you want to label a complex sentence, you can just recursively uh, use the labels of the proposition and the connectives. I, I have one example here, but uh, uh, we can skip this. Uh, it's pretty, pretty easy. Same extensional approach. You can always see the evaluation of a formula, like uh, an expression tree that is evaluated bottom up from the um, labels of the propositions to the labels of the of the of the entire sentence and as i was saying you why are these t norms of such interest for integrating reasoning and learning because they are continuous and differentiable and so you can use a gradient oriented kind of uh, search and reasoning uh, uh, to make uh, everything more scalable scalable However, yeah, there is always the problem that you are shifting the semantics. Usually people start with a Boolean logic in, in, in mind and then use fuzzy logic just to make things more scalable. 
but without really caring a lot about the difference semantic. So for example, if human circuitus is 0, 08, what is, is it true? Is it false? Is it enough just to put that threshold at 0, 05 to say it's more than 0, 05, then it is true? Well, it's very hard to make this kind of choices. For example, I have an example here. Suppose that we have a, a disjunction between five possible values like A, B, C, D, and E. And you want to use this using a fuzzy relaxation. So you say, okay, if I want this constraint to be true in fuzzy logic, I want these constraints to evaluate to one. So the value of this sentence should be to one. And suppose that you use some kind of solver or optimization process that finds the values of the single A, B, C, and D given this constraint, some kind of uh, satisfiability. And let's look at three possible satisfying assignments. The first one is, for example, if all are one, and the, if you pick, for example, the Lukasiewicz the norm, then the, the, the constraint is true, of course. If you pick like one that is one and all the others to be zero, it still satisfies the, the constraints. And both these two assignments are coherent with the Boolean logic. But look at the last one. In Lukasiewicz logic, if you put all of them equal to zero two, the constraint is still equal to one. But if you put, for example, a threshold at zero five, it means that for you, the solution is all of them are false which is not evident to your initial idea of the constraints that ask for at least one to be, to be true. And this is the different semantics uh, that fuzzy logic has. Fuzzy logic, fuzzy logic, for example, and Lukasiewicz, the truth degree can accumulate one another, which is very different from what Boolean logic does. So, okay, yes, you have found a differentiable continuous the interpretation of the logic helps you with learning but the semantics is a bit sacrificed here. Another solution, instead of for making, um, for attaching a continuous semantics to the logic is what is done usually in statistical relational AI, which is to add an additional layer of semantics. What I mean with additional layer? So in general, a probabilistic interpretation is a function that given a sentence of the language, gives a value that is between zero and one. This is very similar, it looks very similar to fuzzy logic. However, in the process in which probabilistic logic assigns values to, uh, to sentences of the language is very different. And it's usually based to this very standard interpretation, this is called the distribution semantics. The idea is that you define a probability distribution over Boolean assignments, so over a Boolean interpretation. So for example, like you pick uh, a given interpretation, for example, Bargary, true, earthquake, false, and so on and so forth. And then given a Boolean assignment, you give a probability over, over, over it, a probability value. So this is another layer of semantics. There is a Boolean uh, semantics that is the model and you are defining like a meta semantics, which is a probability distribution over the, the, the logical semantics. And then when you have this uh, probability distribution defined, if you want to compute the probability of any sentence in the language, what you do is you go over all the possible interpretation and you just pick the probabilities of those that satisfy the, the sentence. So in this case, you see, we are adding another layer. So the, sem the Boolean semantic is still there, but by adding this second level, as we will see, we can uh, attach continuous interpretation, but the link with the Boolean logic is much stronger than it was in fuzzy logic. But this has, um, adds also complexity on top. So we can uh, show an example on how this uh, probability distribution of interpretation is uh, done. For example, using Problog. So Problog was this probabilistic logic programming language that we have uh, seen before, where the main idea is that you attach labels, probabilities, to facts. So given these uh, probabilities, what is the probability of a, of a model? The probability of a model is just the, the product of the probabilities of the facts that are true in that model times the probability of the fact of one, uh, one minus the probability of the facts that are false. All the other facts that are not probabilistic are not 
of uh, are not uh, considered in this value because they are determin deterministically defined from the probabilistic facts. So once you have chosen the probabilistic facts, you can always determine all the other facts. For example, if you pick uh, alarm in this example, well, alarm is completely defined once you have defined both burglary and earthquake. So it's not a probabilistic uh, uh, value. So in this way, you, know, you can attach to a given interpretation a probability just by the product of probabilities. And remember this probably this you can do this because uh, the probabilistic facts are considered uh, independent. So this probability distribution you can consider as a parametric distribution where the parameters are the single uh, labels of the proposition, the single probability of the facts. And if we want to make an example, so suppose that we are, as I said, we are only interested in the probabilistic facts B, E and H, so we can build a table. These are all the possible models for these three values, so all the possible assignments. And if we pick the, um, the one before the last, and we want to compute the probability of this model, well, it's simply we pick burglary equal to one, and earthquake is true, so we pick equal to 005. Well, here's alarm is uh, false, so we have to pick the complement, 1 minus 06. And we multiply them, and we pick the probability of this word. And we can do this for all possible uh, or possible words. And, and the same you can do for Markologic. Markologic is a bit more uh, difficult for... Uh, uh, the, um, the reason that here all the atoms have to be taken into account, not only the probabilistic facts, but the principle is very similar. You pick a model, and you, the, when you have a model, you substitute the model into the rules, sorry, uh, into the rules, and you pick the, 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 the weight of the rules that are satisfied. So, for example, this first assignment satisfies all the rules, so we pick all the, the weights of these rules, while the second model only satisfied the, se the, the second and the third, so we don't consider the, the rules. And remember that semantics, in Markov logic, the assignments or the models are more probable if they satisfy more rules, and this is the, the intuition behind. But again, the goal for this model is just to define a probability distribution over the assignments. Both in Problog and in Markov logic, what you get in the end is a probability distribution of the assignments. Then the question is that, okay, and now how do I compute the probability of every sentence, of a query, of a proof, or a, a constraint? Well, the probability is just the sum of the probabilities of, of the models that satisfy the constraint. This task is very well known. It's called weighted model counting, and you can use it indistinguishably both in problem and uh, Markov logic. So if we pick the Markov logic, uh, the problem case, the problem we had before, we say, okay, <clears throat> our query is just burglary and Ursa Lang John. Well, what you can do here, you go all, all over the, the words and you pick only the ones that satisfy this, this query, which are only these two, and then you can sum their probabilities. Of course, I'm making this very simple, but this is a very, very, very hard task to do because the number of words is it's like an exponential num number, yeah, it's exponential in the number of the, of, of the atoms. So this task is very well, very well studied. You have probably seen the last, uh, uh, the last presentation yesterday, I think it was by Ivan de Broek, and he probably talked this very much more in details. Now, how you can compute this kind of uh, quiz with arithmetic circuits. Uh, but one important thing is that differently from fuzzy logic, you cannot just use an extension approach. You cannot just use the, the labels of the facts in your uh, formula to compute the probability of the formula because you have a lot of probabilistic interactions with all the world and you really need weighted model counting. However, and this really connects to the talk of yesterday, even though you cannot simply trans, uh, translate the expression 3 into a, a, a circuit that you can evaluate, you can translate the original formula 
into an arithmetic circuit using knowledge compilation. And this translation, while logically equivalent, actually puts like introduce all the probabilistic dependencies into the, the three. And once you have this, then the extension approach is still valid also for probabilistic logic. So it's this for me very interesting because both fuzzy logic and uh, uh, probabilistic logic can be seen as building circuits to evaluate uh, to evaluate formulas. And the goal is to have circuits that are continuous and differentiable, because this will, will allow to have, uh, um, to have a easy integration with learning uh, components. Another thing, so we've seen where the model counting where you actually like sum over all the possible words. Another very uh, connected uh, task is um, the most probable explanation, where you, instead of summing, you make a max over all the possible worlds because you have want to find the world that is maximally probable given uh, that uh, uh, the probability distribution. So the ones that satisfy the, the, the query and that is mostly probable. And I want just to keep you in mind because we will see in a, in a moment uh, why this is interesting. But um, um, so fuzzy logic and probabilistic logic actually really works at two different levels. One is an alternative semantics for the logic. One is a, uh, like a, a semantic that's built on top of a, of a logical semantics. So one may wonder, okay, but can we use probabilistic logic over fuzzy logic? And of course we can, and there is another model that is very well known that is called probabilistic soft logic that is simply let's say simply, an uh, um, extension of Markov logic to a fuzzy semantics. So the idea here is instead of having formulas that are interpreted in Boolean logic, you interpret them in fuzzy logic. And why this is useful? Because actually what you are doing here is that you are losing the only advantage in probabilistic logic that you keep between uh, Boolean semantics. Well, the reason is that the MPE problem that I was telling you before, which is a maximization problem, can be solved very efficiently using fuzzy logic because fuzzy logic is differentiable. So even though you lose a lot of uh, uh, a lot of semantics, you get in computational uh, in computational um, cost. So it's much more uh, much more efficient. And you see that this MPE could be used as a block as a building block to, to weigh the model count. So you can do a lot of probabilistic inference very, very efficiently in probabilistic soft logic, which is not true for Markov logic. So how this is useful for neurosymbolic? Why are having all this discussion about semantics in statistical relation AI, how to turn this into a probabilistic model? Well, we have seen that this labeling functions have a very nice interpretation, graphical interpretation, as uh, as these circuits, these inference circuits, where you provide the labels for the propositions, and uh, and then you can evaluate bottom up. So if you look at these circuits, they have all always this property: the structure of the circuit is always determined by the logic. So the logical formula uniquely determines this uh, the architecture. And the leaves of these circuits are the parameters of the corresponding distribution or the uh, truth degree in, in fuzzy logic. And the way you usually provide these values is by a table. So you have a program, and then you say, okay, Bargary is probably 0, 1. Heartquake is probability 0, 0, 4. Same for fuzzy logic. You can say Bargary is true 0, 9 or whatever. So you provide a scalar. So this is a scalar parameterization of these circuits. The, the, the parameters of these circuits are scalar values. However, suppose that you have much more neurosymbolic uh, uh, programs, like uh, something that instead of having just constants, constants are represented as images. Can you still provide a single scalar value for all the images? Of course, this is not possible and feasible anymore. And it is that, well, we can reparameterize the circuit and instead of having scalar parameters, we have neural network as parameters of this circuit. 
So they take the image as input and they provide the corresponding probability as output. Uh, yeah, as output. And sorry. Okay. So this is a very nice way of looking at neurosymbolic. And I would say at the majority of neurosymbolic, you can start from the circuits that are usually used in statistical rationale, for example, in PSL or in uh, Markov logic, deep prolog. And then you can see neurosymbolic methods as a neural reparameterization of this uh, of these circuits. So also to connect to the question of um, that you made me before, so about NeurASP, it, it has a probabilistic interpretation. If you consider NeurASP as like a circuit that is a conjunction of all the possible stable models, so you have this circuit that is the conjunction of all the possible models that allows you to define this probability distribution. The NeurASP is simply a reparameterization. Instead of having just probabilities, they have neural, uh, neural networks below. So this is also valid for NeurASP. So they use a circuit to define the extensionally all the possible models. Some are more like efficient, like arithmetic circuits are more, more compact, but still they are still uh, looking at the space of all the possible models. Some, are, some others are less efficient. NeurASP, I think they use a very flat encoding, like a CNF of all the possible models but then you can still use the same idea. You can reparameterize uh, them using neural networks and you get a neural symbolic model almost for, for free. And this is something that is not done on purpose, but you can really see this connection. For example, if you pick PSL, we have seen that PSL can solve the, um, the most probable explanation problem very efficiently. Well, you can just pick the parameters of PSL and turns these parameters into the output of a, of a neural net. And you can really see that this map one-to-one -to, -one to systems that we have seen before, like uh, semantic-based regularization, LTNs. This is nothing but that. So, so all these systems can be seen as reparameterizations of statistical relation AI models. And this is done completely independently. So it was not done on, on purpose with this specific, but they can be seen and this is very helpful. And of course you can do this also in the probabilistic setting. So you have problem where the, uh, the parameters, the scalar parameters are the probabilities of the facts. You have a marker logic where the, the parameters are the weights of the, of the formulas. Well, you can reparameterize the corresponding circuits using neural nets. And you get two existing models that are deep problem from one side and relational neural machines from the other side. So again, these models can really be seen as reparameterization of star AI models. And one way that is very useful is to um, see this as putting an interface between a purely neural models, so neural nets, and the logic on top. And this is what is done explicitly in deep problem. They say, okay, we introduce a new, pre a new primitive in the language. It is the neural predicate that actually works as an interface between the, the, the two levels, the neural one and the probabilistic one. And this is interesting because given this interface, you are not dropping any property from the logic or any property from the neural net. You have the two paradigms as special cases of the single, of the single uh, model. So you say this model is neural, is probabilistic, and is logic at the same time. You, are, you can do all you can do in the other models in this in, in integrated model, and of course you can do more because you can then start to play with intermixed things. And this idea of neural predicate can really be ported in a lot of uh, nowadays neural symbolic models. So that was my last uh, dimension. I will go into the conclusion. So we have still a bit of time for, uh, for questions. So the general idea I tried to convince you today is that star AI and neurosymbolic should talk much more than they have done since uh, today. Because when logic is involved, then there are a lot of design choices that are shared between these the, the, the models in these two fields. And these connections are actually very, very deep. As a matter of fact, I've tried to convince you that some models can really map to one-to-one -to -one from a star AI method to a neurosymbolic uh, method. 
So really the idea that behind this project we have is to bring the two communities together because both have to say their uh, uh, something, but they should work into the real in the, the same uh, direction. So we have done this along seven different dimensions. If you want to uh, go into more details, uh, I've listed um, a website where there is like a very extensive survey with a lot of examples um, uh, uh, of all the different models and how these uh, dimensions connect. But you may wonder, well, you have solved the problem. Not, not really, because uh, we still don't know which properties the final integrated version should satisfy. For example, I showed you this possibility of introducing an interface between the logical and the neural part. But is this the only choice? Or do we want something where all the logics gets really pushed inside the, the neural network so that the neural uh, paradigms take over? Or something completely opposite, where the neural paradigm is translated into the, the logical part? We really don't know, and solutions are not provided in the literature. It's, very, it's a very open question. There is not enough work here, and we are... Um, there are a lot of new models coming out every day, but the connections with this model and comparison are not uh, are not good enough. And moreover, also, this the, nowadays there is this um, this uh, idea that is borrowed from deep learning to have this model that you can end, uh, learn hand to end. Uh, but it's, this also put a lot of effort. Uh, computational effort to neurosymbolic models. So we have still the question, should we build simple pipelines of models or do we really need this end-to-end -end, uh, uh, end -end model so where everything can talk to uh, everything else uh, but with much more complex model? We still don't, uh, uh, don't know. And again, we have logical features, we have uh, neural features, can we have a more general features to cover both of them? Still very unclear if these two paradigms are even uh, possible to integrate in a deeper, uh, deeper uh, level. And again, we have these integrated mo models, but then the question is that, okay, can you still reason completely logical? Usually when you put the neural net into uh, the, the scene, a lot of the understanding that you have, a lot of the expectation that you can have, everything becomes very fuzzy. And this, there is an entire field now that is trying to understand, interpret what the, uh, the, the neural network can do. And neurosymbolic has a lot to say also in this uh, uh, direction. But again, this is a pretty novel field that is having a really strong boost in the last period, but it's still in its infancy, I would say. So a lot of changes remain. We need a much deeper understanding of what is going on, and we need to find ways of making these systems scale, because it's always very, very different to apply these systems in anything but very simple uh, examples. Which are the best models is not clear, and we really miss real life application. And this is really connected to the scaling because for nowadays, the application for neurosymbolics are very, very, very simple. And it's hard to convince people uh, of this paradigm if uh, we don't find really good, uh, good uh, applications. Of course, the applications are in there. For example, I showed you that uh, uh, autonomous driving, it's an amazing, uh, like, uh, domain for such models, but scaling then becomes really uh, um, a priority. Um, so if you are a um, early stage researcher and you are uh, starting your research career, this is an excellent area for, for, for starting. And with this, I have concluded. Thank you very much. These are the links to the two papers, but I posted already the, the link to this and feel free to ask questions. If you have, of course. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Very, very interesting, uh, short course and uh, very fascinating, too many things. 
to learn and digest as well. <laughs> uh, I think Puma uh, uh, has a question too. I cannot hear you. Maybe you're. Uh, Puma, yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, many thanks for your nice presentation. It was quite interesting. Uh, my question is that atoms were associated with probability. For example, burglary, earthquake has a probability, say 0 0.9, 0 0.8. So I'm trying to connect your initial example of the traffic intersections where they are trying. So in this in this case, if you are trying to connect the probability to the traffic situation, so it's something like the perception tasks are not 100% sure. So for example, if you see some other car, Standing at the intersection, they are with the 0 0.9 probability, not 100 percent probability. So, is this probability coming into picture at that point of time, or when rules will be applied on that say traffic intersections, then probability will come into picture. So, what's the main role of the probabilistic? It's only for the atom detection, or it's only also for the rule applications over the situations because rules, because situations are quite intersection, uh, quite uncertain. So I'm trying to understand what is the use of probability at which stage of the uh, pipeline you can say. Yes. Okay. The idea, and this is pretty clear. For example, in deep problem, is that there is this really this two phase process: the fast and the slow phase. And actually, what one of these two phases should do, what is the task of each of these two level, is up to the designer. So, for example, a very simple way, for example, of modeling this uh, uh, autonomous driving is that, okay, everything that has to deal with the perception is given to the neural net. So, the neural net gives uncertainty about, okay, for me, there is a, a, a car here and a car here with this probability and a car here with this probability, a sign here with this probability. And then the only thing that the logic is left to us is that given this position, what is the probability that this car goes first or something like this? However, yeah. if you have some understanding, for example, okay, there should not be any two cars in the same lane. You know? Even though the neural network will give your first guess, you can still use the logic to improve the, your, also your spatial understanding by adding a level of reasoning. So in that case, probably, Still, the perception is partly done by the neural net, but is also partly done by the, the, the reasoning. So, there, so while there is a very strict distinction from a design point of view, there is not a strict distinction in what each of these two parts should do. If you have knowledge about the task, you should put this in the, in the logic as, as far as it's computable and it's fast to compute, because then it will be taken into account by a net. And this is also a way to control what the net does because you can correct for example errors from the net uh, in in this way so yes there is this distinction but this distinction is not is only from the paradigm that are you using and not in what you can express you can express the entire task at the neural level or you can express the entire task you know, at the logic level or you can intermix the two so this is a lot of scope for mix and matching and trying to add for example, logics can be also associated with probability that in this situations, this logic has this probability and this. So, yeah, that's quite interesting to know. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, uh, there is a question here in the chat that I would like actually to ask you. I think the hopefully short question, and that is a follow up of, of, of what uh, Kumar was uh, asking. Again, about the, the, the traffic intersection the example, that is a very interesting one. The, the feeling I, I have is that what you have presenting today mostly is something like you're combining one single thing. I mean, the logical and the neural uh, aspects of uh, the components. Whereas what I see in that ex particular example, you have two, two separate things that you could basically, the logical part would involve, I mean, are called the neural, uh, in, in neural I mean, uh, representation and computation of, of the perception part. But it, it, for me, that goes maybe in a different direction. It's that of integrating neural uh, computation with logical reasoning. I don't know. Any kind of comment on that? Yes. Now, uh, there is this. Um, so, in neurosymbolic today, most of the neural is connected to perception. And perception, so you say, okay, for me, neural 
is a paradigm for perception. Logic and probability are a paradigm for reasoning. And I don't want to intermix the two things. Now, whether I could agree with using logic for perception is not the right tool, because usually you don't want to uh, reason, for example, at the level of the pixels, but you want to reason at a higher level. Well, maybe you don't call it perception anymore. I, I'm not fully uh, like along the line of considering neural not a paradigm for reasoning. And indeed, there, there are a lot of recent advancements, for example, in geometric deep learning, where they try to use neural nets at the relational level to answer relational queries also at the level. Of course, you lose a lot of interpretability, a lot of control, and how to like link reasoning at using logic paradigm and reasoning using neural paradigm, it's very, 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 very unclear, but it's, for me, it's one of the most interesting things Actually, graph neural network and neural symbolic are both my main interests of research. Actually, is exactly at this level that I would like to see something. But it's very, 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 very hard to have something that is really integrated. The the most uh, like interesting solutions really keep this interface interface, which is not a, a deep integration, but is a discussion between like the two paradigm. But yeah, I agree with you that it's today there is this strict distinction. If this is the, the best thing, I don't know. I really would like to see something that is integrated at a deeper level. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah.